A very good morning to all of you. I welcome you all to in Sarkari. So let's start with today's analysis, which is going to be for 8th of March 2023. So USA is trying to encircle China as per the Chinese foreign minister. So America's Indo-Pacific strategy seeks to tar target China through creation of exclusive blocks. And one of the examples is Quad. And that provokes confrontation and tries to create an Asia-Pacific version of NATO. So this is what the Chinese interpret and they believe regarding the USA's strategy as far as Indo-Pacific is concerned. So here it is talking about Quad. So I hope you all must be knowing about its members and then there is AUKUS also which comprises of Australia, UK and US. So it is a defense pact uh, as being the key elements of the strategy, the Indo-Pacific strategy of the USA. So 8th March is celebrated as International Women's Day. So on the eve, Nagaland's first woman minister assumes the office. So that is an achievement for Nagaland. So live in partnership or marriage, the lines, they are blur when it comes to domestic violence. So here, uh, definitely we have the act for the same thing, but as we say that when we are talking about the live-in partnership, so between live-in partnerships and the marriages, the line is blur. So there needs to be clarity. The law needs to be very clear on this as far as the domestic violence is concerned. So again, as we are celebrating the International Women's Day, so... We see that with hard hats and shovels, women break the rock ceiling also. So like very often we talk about the glass ceiling. So here in the picture, you can see that Coal India Limited's 20,000 women workers, they make up just 8% of his total workforce. But the blooms of the Palash tree have set the rugged brown landscape of Ansol and Dhanbad on fire. So in this otherwise dreary coal mining belt, uh, around 3,277 women of the Eastern Coalfields Limited, they have emerged ground breakers. They crack the earth's crust, mining coal with heavy machinery while breaking gender stereotypes. So in this picture, you can see that a woman is operating this machine, which is basically being used for coal mining. We'll be taking up this issue of migrant workers and try to understand more about it from the Mint newspaper today. So as we see that maximum of the migrants in the state of Tamil Nadu work from Bihar. So even Bihar government has taken some steps to reduce the panic amongst the migrants. So illegal electric fence, it kills three elephants in Tamil Nadu's Dharmapuri districts. And yesterday also we talked about uh, a case study where we, like, we very often talk about the man-animal conflict. But today we are seeing that even like electric fence, they are a threat to elephants. And the same threat goes for the Great Indian Bustard in the state of Rajasthan. So steps are being taken there to make sure and to ensure that the electrical transmission lines, they are buried underground so that the declining number of great Indian bursters is prevented.
So wake up, embrace your power and voice it out. Let's stop crimes against women together. You can see this picture, Delhi Police, International Women's Day 2023. So applying active non-alignment for the Ukraine peace. So the recently held Munich Security Conference, a major concern of the members of the NATO was the reluctance of the Global South to align itself with the G7 on the war in Ukraine. And although the vast majority of the countries across the world, they condemn the Russian invasion and would like the war to come in uh, the, to come to an end, very few countries in Asia, Africa and Latin America, they support the political and economic sanctions on Russia imposed by G7. So basically, they, the G7 or we can say Global South, they are not on the same page when it comes to their stand on Russia-Ukraine war. So the right side of history and ANA, so the answer to the questions which have been raised here. So let's go through the questions first. So why are uh, basically, uh, why are not developing nations more like the Western world or the NATO countries? Why do uh, they, they do not share our concern with the future of a rules-based international order now for the first time in Tatars because of the Russian actions? So basically, the answer to these questions is very simple as for the author of the article and the developing world and especially Africa, Asia and the Middle East and West Asia, there they has been the site of many wars in history, including those of the proxy kind of wars in, in the course of the past 70 years. So none of them was elevated to the category of a unique war that demanded a global involvement to bring it to an end. And suddenly a war erupts in Europe and this means that all bets are off and all countries should chip in to support Ukraine because now uh, we can say that you, uh, Europe is involved in this war and NATO is involved and US has a major role. So now they want that uh, all the countries, they should come together uh, in making sure this war gets end. Yet, as India's external affairs minister has put it, he says that Europe has to grow out of its mindset that Europe's problems are the world's problems, but the world's problems, they are not the Europe's problems. So, basically, this is the stand and this is what even India's external affairs minister has said. So, this is very clear and uh, unable to come to terms with the fact that developing nations are unwilling to wage economic war against Russia let alone provide Ukraine with weapons and ammunition as the United States and Germany. They recently tried to induce Latin American countries to also do so. The Northern leaders, they are quite at a loss uh, to what to do. And a recent call by the Ukraine's president to the African leaders to meet with him over a teleconference turned out to be a fiasco and only four out of the 55, uh, they showed up. So at this particular juncture, what is the right side of the history? So as the international system, it undergoes major shifts and we find ourselves on the verge of a second Cold War, this time between the US and the China, the last thing developing nations need to do is to take sides, allowing themselves to become the play plaything of the others to use Jawaharlal Nehru's famous phrase that it is in this context that the concept of active non-involvement has come to the fore. So active non-alignment, it originated in 2019 and it was developed in 2020 in response to the US-China struggle for primacy in which Latin America was caught in the middle. So it was a bit of a manifesto calling for the Latin American countries not to give in to the pressures from either the uh, Washington or Beijing and to stick to their own particular interest. So it took a pledge, so it took a page from the honorable tradition of the non-aligned uh, movement, but adapted it to the imperatives of the new century. So here, the keyword is since active non-alignment. So it is easy to do as you're told. So it is much more challenging to embrace the agency and come up with a fine-tuned and sophisticated diplomacy that looks at the issues on a case-by-case -case basis. And that is what the active non-alignment is all about. So it looks at issues on a case-by-case -case basis. And obviously, you don't have a universal approach towards everything, towards all the global issues. And obviously, the countries, they first needs to, they first basically need to put their own interest first and 
do not give into pressure by any other country, be it US or be it China. So India's difficult balancing act as far as uh, the Russia-Ukraine war is concerned, but so far we have been able to manage things. But moreover, uh, reactions in the global south to the war in Ukraine show that the active non-alignment is not limited to Latin America. Even uh, global south is a part of it. And this rose in the context of the US-China spat and the conflict with Russia has its own features, but shares others including a certain dynamic of the West versus the rest. So India plays a key role in it, having taken a clear stand of the non-alignment in the world despite its closer ties with both US and Russia. And definitely we're a part of the quadrilateral security dialogue also. So as host and chair of this year's G20, India is managing the difficult balancing act of keeping this important informal group of the developed and developing nations that was instrumental in handling the 2008-9 financial crisis on a steady course, despite the tensions this entails as it became evident in the G20 finance ministers meeting, which was held in Bengaluru recently, because we were not able to come on, uh, on a, a joint statement as far as that meeting was concerned. So definitely there is a role, there is definitely role of BRICS as far as this war is concerned. So moving forward, there is little doubt that BRICS group that in many ways embodies the New South that has emerged in the new century has the potential to play a critical role in furthering some sort of a mediated solution to this Ukraine conflict. Brazil under the leadership of its president, Lula da Silva has indicated its interest in promoting a peaceful solution to the problem. China has come up with its own peace plan, in turn precisely because of its pivotal position, very much holding the balance in the international balance of power. India is in a privileged position to act as a peace broker. And this is what ANA is all about. And not passive neutrality, as some would have us believe, but embodying a proactive attitude aimed at solving the problems and generating the badly needed solutions our troubled world needs is what ANA is about. And in the end, what we have on the table are two very difficult, two very different proposals to deal with this tragic war that has brought so much mayhem and suffering to the people of Ukraine. So one of them is to do what it is takes to bring about a Ukrainian victory and weaken the Russian permanently. And the other is to look for a mediated outcome. That is a peace agreement that would necessarily entail a compromise solution acceptable to both the parties. So as to which one will prevail will depend in part on the ability of the global south not to let itself be drawn into this conflict, but rather aim for a mediated outcome. So let's see what is going to be the future of this war and time is only going to tell us So women, they can harness the digital tools for improving nutrition schemes and initiatives and to create the economic opportunities. So the theme for the International Women's Day 2023 is Digit All, Innovation and Technology for Gender Equality and the Transformational and All-Encompassing Role of the Digital Technology de Technology is Growing Even Faster in the Post-Pandemic World. But sadly, the digital revolution also poses the challenge of perpetuating gender inequality, which is increasingly noticeable in the manner in which women are there being left behind in knowledge of digital skills and access to these new emerging technologies. So definitely technology can be leveraged when we are talking about ensuring nutritional security and empowerment of women. So a case in point is the introduction of digital training and mobile tablets for the cook come helpers who drive the PM potion scheme and 90% of them are women. So basically this is one area where technology and digital training can help improve the efficiency, the effectiveness, the implementation of the PM Potion Scheme. Apart from that, 
The United Nations World Food Program, in partnership with the governments of Orissa and Rajasthan, they have also rolled out technology-based training modules housed in an application and mobile tablets for strengthening the capacity of community in ensuring that proper hygiene and safety measures they are followed so that children they reap the full benefits of nutrition that these school meals offer them. So by bringing together access to digital devices, digital literacy, and community ownership, for women, the initiative has infused fresh energy and confidence in how women perceive and deliver their roles as nutrition champions. And obviously, it is very important when we are talking about the food security also. So unleashing women's economic power helps to lift millions out of poverty and food insecurity. And one of the keys to achieving this is digital literacy. So even digital literacy has an important role in this area. So this strengthens the financial inclusion and creates potential new income streams for women. So having a gender responsive approach is very important to fill the gap of gender inequality. So India accounts for half the world's gender digital divide, given that only a third of all internet users in the country, they are women. In Asia Pacific, India has the widest gender gap of 40%. Less than 32% of women in India, they own a mobile phone compared to over 60% of the men. And women generally, they have handsets that cost less and they are not so sophisticated as those used by men. So these are different, basically, uh, we can say the derivations from the data and different surveys that we come to know about the level and the scale of digital divide in India. So women, they can harness the digital tools for improving both nutritional schemes and initiatives while also using them to create economic opportunities that ensure long-term food and nutrition security. So role of external sector and the fiscal side in recovery. So for sustained economic recovery, government expenditure should not remain tethered to tax revenue. So charting the revival, let's see the charts. They're basically based on data, which has been sourced from Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation and RBI. So chart one, it shows that the growth of export has contributed to the overall growth in the Indian economy. So blue color uh, is basically the graph for the export of the goods and services as a percentage of GDP. This has been plotted on the left axis. So this is there for the exports contribution. So you can see that their contribution or, or their share in GDP growth stands at uh, almost, we can say, 23%. And comparatively, we also have the year-on-year -year GDP growth rate in percentage terms. So here in the last quarter, basically in the third quarter of the current financial year, we so that it came out to be at 4.4%. So this is on this right axis. So that's how it is performing. And you can see that when the exports were increasing, the GDP also grew very sharply. And when the exports performance started to decline, the GDP grew, it fell very sharply. So basically we can say that's how our GDP has been moving in tandem with the performance of the exports. Chart two, oh, sorry, chart one B, it is showing that fiscal spending has also helped in revival, but not as significantly as other factors. So that is there. And chart two is India's trade balance. It deteriorated instead of improving as the rupee lost value in real terms. So whenever we see that Indian rupee depreciates, so our exports become they much they become much more competitive. But at the same time, imports they become costly and expensive, which leads to imported inflation. So here the chart is showing that India's trade balance had deteriorated instead of improving because of the depreciation in rupees. So we can say our exports did not perform well as per the expectations. And obviously the imports at the same time, they became expensive. So that's why our trade balance it deteriorated. And basically blue color is showing the real effective exchange rate index, 2015-16 uh, uh, based. And the red one is the net export as a percentage of GDP. So real effective exchange rate, when it was falling, we saw that 
exports were increasing and then they fell also. Apart from that, again, when the real effective exchange rate fell, the uh, net exports, they rose. So that's there. So is heat in India set to get worse or not? So what does the C, uh, CS, C step uh, study on India's historical climate shows? Has temperature increased in summer and winter? And what about the diurnal temperature range? So what are some of the innovative climate action strategies that one can emulate? So getting hotter by the year, try to understand these maps. The climate crisis is no longer a distant, a distant event that might happen in the future, obviously. And extreme events such as record high temperatures and heavy rainstorms, they are becoming much more common these days. So summer, the summer is maximum temperature, you can see the more darker it is, the more like hotter it is. So that is how the color through color you can see. Apart from that, winter minimum temperature is this. So these maps, they show the maximum, the minimum temperature of Indian states during the summer and winter respectively. So this is the minimum temperature during winter. So it was uh, around, we can say, uh, in this, this uh, range basically, which is 1.5 degrees Celsius range. So... That's there and having a look at the year-wise annual average maximum and the minimum temperatures recorded by IMD between 1990 and 2019 in India. So the annual average maximum temperature, you can see it has been increasing and how sharply it has increased in the past few years. Apart from that, the annual average minimum temperature is also increasing. So both of them are increasing and definitely it is showing that the uh, heat is increasing, the basically temperatures, they are increasing. So it is imperative that states, they step up and they share the responsibility with other stakeholders to implement the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction through improved early warning systems, creation of public awareness and formulation of heat action plans. And the summer temperatures, they have increased by 0.5 degrees Celsius to 0.9 degrees Celsius in many districts in states like Punjab, Haryana, Uttarakhand, Uttar Pradesh. So that's there. So according to the study in the Lancet, which was published in July 2021, with two decades of data, more than 5 million people, they died on average each year worldwide because of extreme temperatures. And obviously we have been uh, like we are... Uh, evident and we are witness to the incidence of extreme heat specifically in Europe also. So what should be done more than ever it is imperative that states they set up in the shared responsibility it is important that there is collaboration between the states uh, and at the institutional level as far as the implementation of Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction is concerned. And in addition, we also need to consider innovative strategies to combat the extreme heat, such as emergency cooling centers must be set up, similar to the ones which have been set up in Toronto and Paris. Survival guides that are strategically displayed to uh, survive the extreme heat or heat waves. Then white roofs, green rooftops, self-shading or tower blocks, and green corridors they must all be made a part of our daily lives. But most of all, it is crucial we prepare the district level heat hotspot map so that different departments of state and district, they can design the long-term measures to reduce deaths due to extreme heat accordingly. So how did the Treaty on High Seas come through? So what is the Treaty on Marine Biodiversity of Areas Beyond the National Jurisdiction? How important are the high seas to human survival and their well-being? So last week, we saw that UN member states, they agreed on a historic treaty for protecting the marine life in international waters that lie outside the jurisdiction of any country. So what are the high seas? So parts of the sea that are not included in the territorial waters or the international waters of a country, they are known as the high seas, according to 1958 Geneva Convention on the High Seas. So that's how basically you can define high seas. And no country is responsible for the management and protection of resources on the high seas. So even like 
mismanagement or not managing things can also lead to worsening of things. So how important are high seas to the human survival and our well-being and our sustainability? So high seas, they account for more than 60% of the world's ocean area and they cover about half of the Earth's surface, which makes them a hub of marine life. So they are home to around 2.7 lakh known species, many of which are yet to be discovered. And the high seas, they are fundamental to human survival and well-being. So however, these oceans, they absorb heat from the atmosphere also. They are affected by phenomena like El Nino. They are also, uh, also undergoing acidification at the same time, all of which endanger the marine flora and fauna. And anthropogenic, uh, anthropogenic pressures on the high seas, it includes seabed mining, there is noise pollution, chemical spills and fires, disposal of untreated waste, overfishing, introduction of invasive species and coastal pollution. So despite the alar alarming situation, the high seas they remain as one of the least protected areas with only about 1% of it is under protection. So we are just exploiting it and not managing it not ensuring the safety or we're not taking some sustainable steps so that the marine biodiversity is not impacted so how long did the process take as far as this uh the treaty is concerned so the un uh, in 1982 the un convention on the law of the seas which is also commonly known as famously known as unclose it was adopted in 1982 so the convention it delineated the rules to govern the oceans and the use of its resources. But there was no comprehensive legal framework that covered the high seas. So as climate change and global warming, it emerged as global concerns or need was felt for an international legal framework to protect the oceans and the marine life. And after years of informal discussions, the UNGA decided in 2015 to develop a legally binding instrument within the framework of UN clause. So Subsequently, the IGC, it was convened to frame a legal instrument on BBNJ and there were several holdups due to the COVID-19 pandemic also. And last year, the European Union launched the High Ambition Coalition on BBNJ to finalize the agreement at the earliest. So what is the treaty all about now? So draft agreement of the High Seas Treaty recognizes the need to address the biodiversity loss and degradation of ecosystems of the ocean. It places 30% of the world's oceans into protected areas, puts more money into the marine conservation and covers access to and use of marine genetic resources. So an important negotiating point and source of tension during the talks was developing countries' access to the benefits reaped from the commercialization of the resources, especially the genetic resources extracted from the ocean. So the treaty has agreed to set up an access and benefit sharing committee to frame the guidelines regarding the same. And it was also underlined that activities concerning the marine genetic resources of areas are as high as should be in the interest of all the states and for the benefit of humanity. So they have to be carried out exclusively for the peaceful purposes also. So India is sending 20,000 tons of wheat to Afghanistan via the Chabar port, which is there in Iran. So India will send its next consignment of wheat as aid to Afghanistan under the Taliban regime via the Chabar port. And basically, uh, the decision announced at the first meeting in the India Central Asia Joint Working Group on Afghanistan in Delhi came after the agreement with Pakistan for sending the wheat over the land route that expired. So that's how we can say India is one of the roles as far as Afghanistan is concerned. And to address the current humanitarian situation, India, uh, the Indian side announced its partnership with the UN World Food Programme for the, for the delivery of 20,000 tons of wheat for the Afghan people through the Chabar port. And then we also have, so at the J, uh, JWG, India also agreed to offer the customized capacity building courses for the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crimes officials and cooperate on initiatives to counter the drug trafficking and rehabilitation efforts of the Afghan drug users, especially the women. So the meet, it comes even as the other Indian and the Central Asian officials, they are taking part in a string of meetings of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization that again would be hosted by India this year.
And then again, talking about women empowerment and women coming to the forefront because we are celebrating the International Women's Day. So we see that Shaliza Dhami is the first woman to be appointed as the Indian Air Force Command Post. And in picture, you can see her. The group captain, Shaliza Dhami, will take over command of a frontline Indian Air Force Combat Unit in the Western Command. So exhibition in a New Delhi is going to showcase the repatriated artifacts. So in this picture, you can see the parrot lady of Khaju Rahu was brought back to India in 2017. So the exhibition showcasing 26 repatriated Indian antiquities put up at the Khaju Rahu G20 Culture Group meeting will now be displayed in the national capital in a bid to keep the spotlight on the prevention of illicit trafficking of antiquities. So that's there. And what is important for us is to know that which all antiquities will be put up and having some information about them, about their background would be important for us. Moving forward, so concerns over linking Aadhaar with the voter IDs, the activists, they have raised issues of privacy, disenfranchisement and coercion as a result of this exercise. So they are fearful of these outcomes. So hailstorm and unseasonal rain damage the crops in three states. That includes Maharashtra, Gujarat, and Madhya Pradesh. And they've ordered surveys to estimate the damage to the standing crops in the affected districts. And obviously, this has a, a direct impact on the inflation because then food, the amount of food production is impacted because of these sudden unseasonal rains and hailstorms. Coming to the world page. So pro-Ukraine group is behind the gas pipeline attacks as the U.S. officials. And there's the Nord Stream gas pipelines, which has been attacked. Adani prepays around rupees 7,000 crores of share backed financing. So they're taking efforts in order to ensure that the impact of the Hindenburg Research Group is diluted as soon as possible and the company is not impacted. However, we have seen from the last few days the Adani stocks, they are jumping back again. So the conglomerate says that move is consistent with the commitment to reduce the overall promoter leverage and strengthen the balance sheets. And Hindenburg had in its report flagged the group's high level of debt also. So pairing with the pledges, the Adani group is bearing the level of debt raised through pledges of promoter stakes as it seeks to bolster the balance sheets. So this is definitely again a move uh, in bolstering and increasing the trust and confidence of people in the Adani group of companies. And growth slowdown in late 2022 is temporary. So Moody's analytics that said India's domestic economy rather than trade is its primary engine of growth and the slowdown in economic activity late last year would only be temporary in nature. And we've been talking about this thing that definitely trade was one of the most important components. But when we talk about the resilience of the Indian economy, it was the domestic Consumption demand, that was one of the major and important factors in driving our economic growth. And China's Jan to Feb exports and imports, they drip again as the global demand trips. So imports have also dropped and see exports have also fallen. So there is the impact of inflation. And mutual funds, they have only 10% of the women wealth managers. So the total number of fund managers, it saw a healthy increase this year to 428. 
so the role of women is still very less so fed is like fed likely needs to raise the rates higher possibly faster coming from powell so it is a uh, like very concerning situation coming from him so it is basically going to trigger more uh, more and higher inflation expectations in future so this is this does not put us in a comfortable situation as far as the inflation rate is concerned as far as obviously it would be impacting the investment it would be impacting the gdp growth also so this is a cause of concern Coming to Mint, so how fake news has alarmed the Tamil Nadu's migrant workers? Obviously, this has been because of sharing of the fake videos on the social media platforms, which has caused fear. So we'll not be reading all these things because we are already aware of this. So what's being done to reassure the migrant population by the state machinery? So they have sprung into action to call out the fake news and instill confidence in the migrant workers. Chief Minister has taken the command himself and he is warned of strict legal action against those spreading the fake news. And it is reminded everyone that it is known for its hospitality and support for people who come and settle down there. So the state governor, the district collectors, the local police and industry bodies, they've all stepped in to calm things down through statements, through face-to-face -face meetings with workers and videos. And even officials from Bihar and Jharkhand, they have visited Coimbatore and Tirupuru to meet the migrants so basically the mi major of the migrant population it is from the state of Bihar and Jharkhand so even they have come into to ensure that the migrant population do not and basically this thing does not lead to a mass exodus so the, are there like there are reports of an exodus true so no migrants they are not leaving the state in large numbers as of now it is seasonal migrants they leave for their homes at this time of the year for holy but some social media channels they have called this an exodus but the industry is worried that fear it may deter some from returning to work so that is a concern for the industries so what role do the migrants they played in, they play in tamil nadu's economy so migrants they have become critical to the state's economy and as per the government's report the number of migrants in the state of tamil nadu is that it is 3.5 million this was uh, as per 2011 census today that number much be much higher with over a million in manufacturing alone and like migrants, they across the world, they have filled the jobs that locals vacated or refused to take, say the entrepreneurs and the experts say that it will have an important role to play if the state governments is to achieve its ambition of making Tamil Nadu a billion dollar economy by 2030. So has the issue taken political color? Not important for us. Moving on to the Financial Express. So here, government has done its bit in the budget. Prime Minister to India, Inc., it's your turn to invest now. So applications are continuously pouring into a veil of the production-linked incentive scheme, which makes India an important part of the global supply chain. And the increase in the tax base is proof that people have faith in the government and they believe that the tax paid is being spent for the public good. So when we talk about the unicorns, so you you need to be clear with this thing that what is actually a unicorn, so a company having a, having total worth of over $1 billion is categorized as a unicorn, but not yet a woman's world. We do not have much women leaders in this sector. Modern transmission grid. So a modern transmission grid is vital to achieve the government's vision to provide 24-7 reliable and affordable power to the people and a fully automated, fast, responsive grid, which is resilient to cyber attacks and nat natural disasters is the need of the hour when we are talking about the modern transmission grid. So India is not immune to stagflation that felled its neighbors. 
So like all the emerging markets that rely upon the rest of the world for commodities and the capital, India has spent the last two years battling the twin challenges posed by more expensive raw materials and a stronger dollar. So in the past, trouble would come individually and not as a pair. But when food, fuel and fertilizer skyrocketed between 2002 and 2008 also, the US currency, it was cheap and it was abundant. So right now, we are having twin challenges both at the uh, exchange rate front and also expensive raw materials. So when the greenbacks rose between... 2011 and 2020 the basic ingredients they became less costly so this movement in the opposite direction tended to offset the overall negative impact on the output and the prices but when the two soared in tandem in 2021-22 stagflation risks they have increased in commodity importing developing economies this is as per the research by bank for international settlements So palm oil imports, they may jump to a four-year high. Yesterday also we talked about it, that government has imposed higher amount of customs duty on the imports of palm oil so that the domestic producers are in a comfortable situation and their interest is not impacted much. So India's palm oil imports, it could jump 16% in 2022-23 to a four-year high of 9 million ton as the consumption is set to jump after two years of contraction due to COVID-led lockdowns and higher purchases by the world's biggest importer of the vegetable oils, that is India, it could lend Further support to the palm oil futures, which are trading near their highest level in the four in the in four months. So that's there. Moving ahead. So electric vehicles going to raise India's reliance on China. So here GTR report it flags concerns over the electric cars. So manufacturing of electric vehicles in India will increase its dependence on China for the raw materials, mineral processing, and battery production, as per a report. And recently we also discovered lithium reserves in German Kashmir. So that was one of a relief because lithium uh, as it is used in batteries so that would be one of the thing because right now we are 100 percent dependent upon lithium imports so china has bought the largest lithium mines in australia and in south america so china has bought their lithium mines in australia and in south america so it processes more than 60 percent of the lithium produced globally so it also processes 65 percent of cobalt and 93 percent of manganese so you can see china's monopoly in this sector and china makes three out of the four batteries which are produced globally and electric vehicles they have implications on jobs and pollution and it identified 13 users you issues sorry 13 issues related to the interest of the consumer industry government for an evaluation so this is as per the report so we need to find out a solution to this problem, at least that we can try to reduce our reliance on China as far as the electric vehicles is concerned. Obviously, this is like it requires some long term steps and measures, but at least we should start with the things. So uh, Sri Lanka's debt plan gets China's backing finally, and it paves the way for a bailout. And India had, well, like long back, provided the assurance for this. So island nations' currency soars most since 1989, and Sri Lanka's rupee rallied by most in over three decades in stocks. They surged as China's support for the nation's debt plan and the central bank's move to scrap the currency trading ban it boosted optimism. So uh, the latest economic data have come in stronger than expected, which suggests that the ultimate level of interest rates is likely to be higher than previously anticipated from Jerome Powell, who is the U.S. Fed chair.
So equity versus equality, you need to be clear with the meaning of meaning and the interpretation of these two terms. So equality suggests that, well, let's give everyone an equal share. This is what equality is. But equity understands not everyone starts out at the same base. And so we need to take that into account and have policies that are motivated by equitable outcomes. So that's there. So talking about the investment intentions, definitely they must be translated into the actual capital expenditure to revive a cyclical upswing in the economy because right now we are seeing that investment is declining as far as the Indian economy is concerned. So deep going structural reforms to free up the land and labor markets are needed to boost the overall pace of private sector led economic expansion. So we also had the four labor codes coming up and such reform also has a crucial bearing on the government's intent to attract foreign investments that are shifting out of China. So for India to be an automatic choice in this regard, it will have to be competitive vis-a-vis -vis the Asian rivals with a manufacturing ecosystem and better infrastructure. It is only when these foreign and domestic investments, they materialize rather than remain intentions that are virtuous spiral in that is virtual spiral is initiated to sustain the growth story because we also talk about that uh, investment has a higher amount of multiplier effect also so that's why it is important that we attract the investment the investors uh, which are moving out of the chinese economy so it's a kind of an opportunity for us So India's century has begun. The growth of India's teacher is closely tied to that of Modi's. And this is a good thing for the future of its 1.4 billion people. So the world's view of India has completely changed from what it was over a decade ago. Definitely, we can feel that thing. And we can also see that from making introductions at the door, we are now being welcomed warmly. So that's all for today. Thank you for joining on Sarkari and you'll be also getting the PDF link in the description box. Do not forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the like button for this video if you're finding the videos helpful on everyday basis and you're following us every day and please share the video as much as possible. Thank you so much for joining us for today.